but let's look for something fresh tonight. Amen. If you have your Bibles, look with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at the third chapter, Exodus chapter number three. And I want to begin reading to you from verse number one. Let's all stand together if you're able to do that. Stand together for the reading of the scriptures here, as Exodus chapter three and verse number one. Now, Brother Doug, do I need to turn any buttons on? Are we all right? Everything's okay? All right, very good. Now, notice with me, verse number 1, Exodus chapter 3. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to mount, the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and beheld the bush burn with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Boy, don't you appreciate Moses? I tell you what, the more I study, read my Bible, boy, what an interesting character he was. Somebody said the first 40 years of his life, he thought he was a somebody. The second 40 years of his life, he found out that he was a nobody. In the last 40 years, he found out what kind of a somebody God makes out of a nobody. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it just takes a long time for us to know where we really, where we really belong. Amen. Absolutely. We're going to look at him and this wonderful story about the burning bush. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we come tonight and we ask now for blessing upon the service tonight. Our hearts have already been refreshed. The fellowship, Lord, has been sweet. And uh, the singing, our hearts have been stirred. And then for us to be able to lift up our voices and sing these beautiful songs that mean so much to us. And then to hear Brother Ed and Sister Laura sing, we just uh, have been so blessed. Thank you for being so good to us tonight. And I'm sure glad that I'm here tonight. I'm glad that you brought these folks here tonight. Would you just bless us, we pray tonight. Save the lost, reclaim the backslider. Strengthen our faith. All of us need our faith to be strengthened and challenge us spiritually, God. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for standing with me. Man, when you think of Moses, really, the story here of the burning bush, it was really the first time that uh, you see anything happening like this, really the first major miracle in the Bible. And uh, Moses, what's a, such an interesting character, well, I came across the writings of an old-timey Baptist preacher by the name of I.M. Halderman. He pastored a Baptist church in New York City, and he was famous for writing a bunch of articles uh, against women pastors. Now, this was like way back in like the 1920s. Can you imagine what he would be doing today? <laughs> Amen. And uh, that's kind of why I like him. Amen. But this is what he said about Moses. He said, Moses, his, uh, the life of Moses presents a series of, of opposites. He was a child of a slave and the son of a queen. He was born in a hut and lived in a palace. He inherited poverty and enjoyed unlimited wealth. 
He was a leader of armies and the keeper of flocks. He was the mightiest of warriors and the meekest of men. He was educated in the court and dwelt in the desert. He had the wisdom of Egypt and the faith of a child. He was fitted for the city and wandered in the wilderness. He was tempted with the pleasures of sin and endured the hardships of virtue. He was backward in speech in speech, and talked with God. He had the rod of a shepherd and the power of the infinite. He was a fugitive from Pharaoh and an ambassador from heaven. He was a giver of the law and the forerunner of grace. He died alone on Mount Moab and appeared with Christ in Judea. No man assisted at his funeral. God buried him. Amen. So when you think about Moses and this story of the burning bush, really there's a lot of neat things about it that we can glean from tonight. The burning bush marks the beginning of God's direct intervention into human affairs. And the burning bush is really the first miraculous phenomenon mentioned in the Bible apart from, the, from, the, from Enoch being translated. Remember he was translated, God took him. And then, of course, we have the miracle of Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. But as far as God, first-hand basis, intervening really in the affairs of men, you see it right here in the story of the burning bush. It is the basis for the call of Moses to return to Egypt as Israel's deliverer. And I mean, he had a lot to be concerned about when he was coming back into into Egypt because of the way that he left. It marks the beginning of the end of Egyptian oppression. The burning bush made not only a profound impact upon Moses and the nation of Israel, but it continues to serve as one of the, uh, those key events in the history of the chosen people of God. Amen. I mean, when you hear the Israelites, the modern-day Israelites, it's amazing how they bring up the stories of Abraham and Moses because it is, a, it is a intricately interwoven into their history. It was no meaningless miracle intended to just get Moses' attention. God was going to do something very, very special about that. As a matter of fact, in Mark, Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter number 20, they're known to the Jewish people as the burning bush portions, because it talks about it. And, uh, but I want to pose a question to you this morning. Now think with me as I'm kind of laying a foundation for my message this, this evening. I want you to think with me. Do you think there's any kind of a meaning to the burning bush that, uh, that maybe is that's, uh, talked about, that's given to us in the Scripture? Does God want it to mean something? We know that it was an event. We know that Moses beheld it. We know that the bush was burned, but it wasn't consumed. We know that out of that experience, God called Moses to this task. But does the burning bush, does it itself, does it mean anything? Does it represent something or someone uh, that we know of in the Bible? Amen. Keep in mind, we want to be true to the Scriptures. The meaning, the bush that burns, uh, uh, I feel like if you're going to pin me down and say, what do you believe about it? I would have to believe because of Moses, because of Egyptian bondage, because of what God was initiating at the burning bush. And I feel like probably that bush, if it stands for anything or anyone, really it's a beautiful picture of no doubt of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also it is a picture of the nation of Israel. And you cannot even watch the news today and the news cycle all day long without hearing something about that tiny little portion of land there uh, that we know of as Israel. Those, that, that place there, the bush that burns, has to be the nation of Israel. Think about it. They were enslaved by Pharaoh. They, are, they were harassed by the Gentiles. They were possessed or oppressed by Sennacherib. They were massacred by Nebuchadnezzar. They were slaughtered by the Romans. 
They were banished from England. They were persecuted by the Europeans. They were stripped of possessions by France. This is all history. They were burned by Germany. They were robbed by Spain. They were gassed and cremated by Adolf Hitler. But the bush still burns today. The nation of Israel has never been consumed. And as a matter of fact, if anybody can get rid of the nation of Israel, then everything we believe about the Bible is all false. That's why it is at the very center of prophecy as we're moving into these last days of the last days. Today, Israel is the only nation still speaking the languages of the Bible in everyday concourse. Probably the greatest miracle in the Bible until the plagues of Egypt is the sign of the bush that burned and was not consumed. No doubt the greatest miracle in history aside from the literal physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is the survival of a nation against opposition that would, have, that would have obliterated any other nation a dozen times. Name one nation beside the nation of Israel that could have survived 3,000 years of dispersion and separation and betrayal and persecution and ridicule and 10,000 bloody pogroms, massacres by 18 nations and many of them more than 10 times her size. But the nation of Israel still burns bright. She still lives. She still is the apple of God's eye. Now I understand they're secular Jews. We understand that. They are godless Jews. They're, they're wicked Jews. As wicked as any Gentile you could ever imagine. But still, as a nation, they're God's chosen people. So there's no doubt in my mind that the burning bush really is a wonderful example, a wonderful symbol of an amazing nation, a chosen people, and God has not given up on the nation of Israel. Amen? Now, listen to what Isaiah 63, 9 says. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love. And in his pity, he redeemed them and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Amen. But tonight, I'm asking you to allow me, uh, listen, this, uh, to uh, pivot on this grand idea. And I'd like for you tonight to let me use the burning bush as a picture of the blood-washed church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? I'm preaching tonight on the Burning Bush Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Because I think using this story here, this, uh, this thing that we see here, it serves so perfectly. It provides a beautiful picture of how God's chosen instrument upon the earth right now and it's here for His glory and for world evangelism and for discipleship Amen. And believe me, the church has undergone a lot of persecution. Now, I'm not making a doctrine out of this. You understand that. I'm only using it as an example to stir our minds to a greater passion and a broader understanding and vision of what God is doing, that what God did, and that He purchased this church uh, as every good biblical church uh, by His own precious blood. You see, the burning bush Baptist church, it, uh, the burning bush serves a perfect example as a symbol of the church and the people of God in all ages. And this is how it symbolizes both of them. The church, like Israel, had a birth. Remember, a nation was born at once. Amen. They were walked right out of Egyptian bondage. The church, like Israel, had to be redeemed by blood. The church, like Israel, has gone through the fires of persecution. The church, like Israel, occupies a position of God's favor. Think about that. The church and Israel are both, in the Bible, the people of God. The church, like Israel, is a witness to the Word of God. 
The church like Israel has the same shepherd. Amen. The good shepherd and the great shepherd and praise God, the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. The church like Israel is loved with an everlasting love. Amen. And the church like Israel is a recipient of eternal life. Amen. The church and Israel are both called the elect. Going back to our conversation at supper time with Brother Schweitzer and the preacher. Amen. The church uh, uh, membership into the Jewish nation was by birth or becoming a proselyte, a convert of Judaism, and membership into the church uh, is by the new birth, born of the Spirit. Amen. Oh, listen, so I'm asking you tonight to let me present to you the burning bush as a burning bush Baptist church with four examples from the Scriptures tonight. Amen, I'm asking you to let me do that tonight. Would you let me do that? Well, whether you let me do it or not, I'm still going to do it. Amen. (laughs) But I want you to see, number one, the burning bush Baptist church is a place where the Lord's presence is. Amen. Where the Lord's presence is. Now I can remember times in this church where we had some pretty wonderful services, amen, where the presence of God was with us here in such a powerful way. I mean, listen, we wish it would be like that every single week. I just don't know if we could just take all of that, but amen. Listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where the presence of God is. Now look at Exodus chapter number 3 and verse number 1 again. And let me show it to you here with that in mind. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led uh, the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, uh, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed uh, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. It also goes along with Acts chapter 7 and verse number 30, which says, uh, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Amen. So I want you to understand that the burning bush Baptist church is a place where the presence of God is. Remember what Revelation chapter 113 says? It says this, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. I'm telling you, listen, when the presence of God settles in a place, you're, there are going to th- be some things that you are going to sense. I don't like to use the word feel because that is so subjective, amen. It's more than a feeling. It is something that is real. And I'm telling you, when the presence of God settles in a place, there's going to be conviction. I know a lot of people don't like that, but I'm telling you, when God settles in a place, there's going to be conviction. The Bible says in the book of John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world. The ministry of the Holy Ghost of God is a ministry of reproof. And listen, when God, the Holy Ghost, convicts you of something in your life, that is because His presence is here. Whoa, I almost fell down. Amen. I need to find out where I'm at here on this platform. Well, listen, people don't like that. They want to go to a church where it's entertainment, where you feel good. Where do you get a little sermonette on how to handle stress? Well, I'm not here to tell you how to handle stress. I'm here to give it to you. Amen. Hey, that's what I'm all about, praise God. But I'm telling you, when the, when the presence of God is in a place, there is going to be conviction. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin 
and righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. So I'm telling you, when you're living worldly and when you've got sin in your life, And listen, when you've been acting like a terrible father or a terrible mother or a rebellious kid, and when you come to the house of God and the Holy Ghost of God starts bothering you about it, that's the presence of God. And don't run from conviction. Run to conviction. I'm telling you, listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where there's conviction there, amen. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You better make sure that you got your family in a church that is going to preach and teach the Word of God. I'm telling you, there are dozens, dozens of Christians They're so weak in their faith. They're not strong. They can't see it. And they're going to go into these modern churches and they're going to be swept out and their kids are never going to hear a clear plan of salvation and get saved. Or their kids are going to be swallowed up by the world. Where the presence of God is in the Burning Bush Baptist Church, there's going to be conviction there's going to be joy and peace in believing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, Now the God, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Oh, I'm not talking about ramping things up to get you in some kind of hypnotic hysteria. I'm not talking about a bass guitar and bass drums and black lights singing something over and over and over again, trying to hypnotize the people of God with songs and nonsense. I'm talking about straightforward preaching and teaching from the Word of God. Where the Spirit of God is, amen, there's liberty. Oh, the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 1 and 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, Jesus was there. The burning bush Baptist church is a place where the presence of God is is amen and you know what if God's people were learned to sense it to sense where they know God is here and you'll respond to it and you'll welcome it amen listen then he resides oh I, I, I remember Dr. Runyon we was in a service at football camp and one of the last services that we had and brother Ted Houston did he ever preach here for you brother Brother, I mean, Brother Houston was a sweet man of God. I'm telling you, listen, uh, he, he mounted the pulpit at football camp on one afternoon. I stayed in the, in, the, in the same room with Brother Ted Houston. And I remember I went to bed and Brother Houston got down on his bed, got on his knees beside his bed, put a big old cover around him because we had it about 30 degrees in that hotel room. Now, I'm not kidding you, but Brother Houston pr- prayed all night long. I got up the next morning And there he was finishing up. Brother Houston got up in that chapel of football camp and he just said this, do you love God? That was all he said. And the power of God filled that place. I mean, coaches and men and boys and people just began to flood. We were in like about a two or three hour invitation after that. And that was all that was said. You know what that was? That was a sweet presence of God. You see, the burning bush Baptist church is a place where God's presence is. So listen, when God nudges you, when he squeezes your heart, when he convicts you of something, it's a big deal. Don't just say, well, I'm not going to go forward or I'm not going to deal with that or I'm not. Oh, listen, we're talking about God, the creator God. There's not a time when, I, when my family was in my home and we, they was growing up and I'd say something to my sons or my daughters, I wanted a response. Don't ignore me. If I say something to you, respond back to me. Well, I think it's the same thing with God. If God says something to you, respond back to him. Don't ignore him. Don't shirk it. Respond to him. 
The Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where the presence of God is. I want you to see number two. The Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where people's future is changed. Their people's future is altered. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 verse 3, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. You see, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where God's people, amen, they learn about the will of God for their lives. Oh, I know that I've said this to you before, but, but it, just, it just speaks to my heart. I remember as a nine-year-old boy getting on a Sunday school bus, going to the Open Door Baptist Church. Now, I did not come from a, from a home that lacked love. My mom and dad loved us dearly. My dad was a wonderful provider. And my mother was a very loving and affectionate mother. She was a wonderful mother. Cooked. We ate all of our meals we ate around the table. We never did grab a hot dog and go play a video game. We didn't do that. We ate around the table. My mom cooked every meal. And that's the kind of home that I grew up in. My dad was a, the breadwinner. He was a hardworking man. But there was just something about the love of a Sunday school teacher and a bus captain and a bus driver that reached out to me. And I started riding that Sunday school bus. And I started hearing about Jesus. And all of a sudden, man, finally I got my salvation nailed down at 15. I made a profession when I was nine years old. I might have got saved. I don't know for sure. But I thank God for that because... I believe that God used that, that experience as a nine-year-old boy to keep me close to the church, to keep me close to the people of God. If I hadn't had anything like that, I might have wondered and got into drugs or what, what else I could have got into there. And God used it. And I tell you what, my life was literally altered. Altered. The course of my life changed. And I'm telling you, when Moses, when he, when he saw that burning bush and he heard that voice and it was not consumed. His life was altered. And listen, a burning bush Baptist church is a place where people come and they get their lives altered. Their life changes. They're going to hell. They get born again. They get to go to heaven. They're wasting their life on the world. They surrender to God and they begin to make their lives count for Jesus' sake. And those are decisions that you have to do. The Bible says, uh, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God says, you not, you've got some skin in the game. You've got to make some decisions. Well, I tell you, listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where God's people, they learn about the will of God. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Amen. God called him into a leadership position. Oh, listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where people come and they hear the Word of God preached and taught and they meet God's people and all of a sudden the will of God is opened up. They would have never known it before. But the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and applying it and people believe it and their lives are altered. Nine-year-old boy riding that bus. And now look at all I've, had, I've been able to do for these 42 years. I have been able to preach the gospel around the world. The last one of the na last analysis that we took, we had 143 different countries visit our radio station website. 143 countries. Can you imagine that? Amen. It's hard to imagine. And then just uh, recently, my wife got to go with me on a mission trip. She learned what a third world country. I'd been warning her about a third world country, and she found out what a third world country is, and she looks, she sure likes first world countries. Amen. <laughs> There's a big difference. I remember my mom was telling my mother about it. She says, Oliver, what in the world, what is a third world country? I said, Mom, you just have to see it to know a third world country. Oh, listen, a burning bush Baptist church is a place where people, where their lives get changed. Amen. Amen. 
And you have to stay with it, amen? <clears throat> you got to stay with it. 1 John 2 and 17 says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Do you want your works to abide forever? Then do the will of God. And you'll learn the will of God in a good church. Number three, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where people are taught to respect the holiness of God. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 5 it says, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. So I believe that a, a Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where people are taught, children and teenagers are taught, to appreciate and to respect the holiness of God. God is a holy God. Amen. And we don't, we don't just drag Him down to our world. We want to bring our world up to Him. Amen. Amen. God doesn't need black lights. God doesn't need light shows. He doesn't need smoke. He doesn't need light shows, leg shows. He doesn't need any of that stuff. Amen. God's place is a holy place. Amen. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7 verse 33, Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from, off, uh, from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now listen to these verses here. Psalm 99 verse 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 2 There is none holy as the Lord for there is none beside thee neither is there any rock like our God. Man, I love that verse. Amen. And then 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Yeah. Hey, adults. Hey, kids. You need to know how to behave in the house of God. Amen. Amen. How to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I remember just a, oh, it's probably been a month or so, there were some little kids in our church was running around and one of uh, well, our seniors seniors was in the, standing in the center row and that one of those little boys just shot by him and it kind of, uh, uh, kind of put him off balance. And I mean, he stopped him. And he said, hey, hey, come here, son, come here. And it was brother, one of Brother uh, Yoho's boys, that little boy. And he said, now, son, listen, I'm, I'm an old man and I've got to walk with a cane. And when you come running through here like that, you almost put me off balance and I could have fall, fallen. And he said, son, you got to be careful. And uh, he didn't want to stay there, but he did. But his brother saw him. So his biggest big brother grabbed him and took him to his mom. So he talked to his mom about it. And then his mama brought him back to the elder. And he said, now you tell him. You tell Brother Steve Workman that you're sorry. And boy, that little boy, he's, I don't know, how old would he be, Kim? Maybe six, five years old. I mean, it, 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 everything in him, it took him, everything in him to say, I'm sorry. I don't really know if he really was. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that his mom and dad saw it through and said, now look, you can't do this. Now, well, I understand you don't want it to be so stringent that kids hate the place, amen, but it also can't be so common that they just, uh, you know, just mill around and act like it's nothing special. It's a place, it's a place. amen, it's a holy place. Amen. And it's where God does business amen. and where we're going to pay attention and we're going to bring our Bibles, amen. amen, a book Bible, amen, not just a pad Bible or a phone Bible, a book Bible, amen. amen. I'm not even going to look around because I might see something I don't want to see. <laughs> There's just something about having a book Bible, amen? Man, listen, you bring a phone Bible or a pad Bible, people don't know if you're playing games or what, looking at the stock market, amen? Get your book Bible, amen? Number four, the burning bush Baptist church is a place where God's people learn that God hears and answers prayer. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And then Acts chapter 7 verse 34 says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt and I have heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. The burning bush Baptist church is a place where people see, they see God answer prayer. Amen. I might have mentioned this before here, but I, I remember I started a new year off and something caught me. Uh, on the like one of the, the first Sunday of the of the new year, and I don't remember what what year it was, but something struck me about church going through a prayer list, and they prayed for a whole lot of sick people, and I'm I'm, I'm for praying for sick people. We need to pray for sick people and all kinds of things, but not one time did anybody in that opening prayer time pray for anybody to be saved, not one, and I took a mental note of it. And I can't even remember how far into the year it was to where I heard somebody say, let's pray for my friend Joe. He needs to be saved. Now folks, listen. I'm a protege of evangelist Dr. Joe Boyd. One of the things that we did when we went into a revival meeting is that we would make us a, a, a sweetheart prayer list where we would put on a chalkboard that's how long ago it was. Anybody know what a chalkboard is? Amen. We'd put on a chalkboard names of people and we'd start praying for those people and then we'd start going and witness to them and we'd see them saved. Oh, listen, we need to pray for the lost to be saved. Pray for them to be saved and then we got to make efforts to go give them the gospel. Follow through. Pray for the lost. Listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where God's people know that God hears and answers prayer. Amen. Yeah. On Saturday, Saturday at 7.45 in the evening, I meet many times, not every week, but most of the times I meet with a group of pastors and we have a, we have a prayer time on the phone. It could be anywhere from, you know, a half a dozen to sometimes a dozen men on, Saturday, on Sunday night, and we pray together. And it's praying for a campaign called Fill America about trying to get people right into, once again, uh, distributing gospel tracts on an on a organized way. And this coming week, this coming Saturday, we'll start our first campaign for 2024. There's probably about 400 churches that are involved in this, and we ramp up our efforts and we see how many tracts we can give out on an aggressive way. We ought to do it all the time, but we really pull out the stops and just ramp it up for two weeks. And I have a team that is connected to the radio station, 17 people. I told about it on the radio, and they called in, and they said, we want to be a part of the WVGV uh, Phil America team. So I send them tracts and, and supply those, and then they report back. And I think last time we did that, we had uh, like a little over 2,000 tracks distributed in those two weeks. Now, that's not breaking any records, but you got to remember in West Virginia that a lot of these people, they come from little churches. They're never going to be, it's never going to happen in that church. But because they're connected with us for the first time ever, they are a part of getting out the gospel. And they are going to meet people that I will never meet. They have a sphere of influence that they, can, that they can influence for the gospel that they'll never listen to me. So we got these people now a part of getting out the gospel. Amen. Well, anyway, a couple of weeks ago, one of the preachers on that prayer call said, he said everybody knew that he is on a built, on a, uh, has a building program going and uh, they, they've uh, run out of money and they need some money. And the preacher of that church was uh, doing a meeting somewhere and he stayed at a hotel and he saw a man at the hotel eating breakfast on a Sunday morning and he said, hey, listen, uh, are you, are you, do you have any plans to go to church? He said he had real greasy, dirty looking coveralls and looked like a, he said, I, I thought he was a homeless person. 
And he said, and I just said, hey, listen, are you, uh, are you going to go, go anywhere for church? He said, I'm going to be leaving in a little bit. He said, if you want to drive ride with me, you're welcome to ride with me. And, and he said, I think I'll do that. So the preacher met him down in the vestibule, and the man that had on dirty coveralls on got in a car with him and went to church. And then he ended up getting saved. And, uh, and then they was all going out to eat together, and they invited him to go out to eat. So when they were eating there, the pastor said, uh, give me the bill. But that man that had those dirty coveralls on, he got the bill and he paid for it. Come to find out, he was a millionaire. A millionaire. And uh, the preacher didn't know it. He thought he was a homeless man. And he's uh, like, he's built all kinds of houses for like people that are in need and ha houses like Ronald McDonald houses and stuff like that. And uh, man, here, this guy, he thinks he's a homeless guy. But I mean, like, I mean, this guy's like heavy on the hip, like my father in law says. He's got some bucks. And, uh, and just a couple of weeks ago, he visited that man's church up there. And I don't really know what all happened, but I think probably something pretty good happened. Amen. You know what? The Burning Bush Baptist Church is a place where God's people, they see God answer prayer. Now, we're going to start looking for all these homeless looking people. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to, amen. I don't know about you, but I'm going to. Oh, listen, God's good. Now, here's a couple of questions I want to ask you. Are you contributing to the success of making your church a burning bush Baptist church? Do you, are you trying to do your part to make your church a burning bush Baptist church for the glory of God? Amen. What can you do? What can you do? I'm talking about the simple things. Listen, if the church would just corporately be involved in, in serious, serious prayer and pray for power and study and study the Bible and the winning of souls, try to win souls, make it a point to present the gospel and try your best to bring people to church. Try, always be inviting. Get people to church. And, and you know, Brother, Roll, uh, Brother uh, Lee Robertson used to say, three to thrive, it takes three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Amen. Three to thrive, three to thrive. Amen. Amen. Go, go, church, go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Read the Bible, pray and tithe and separate from the world and serve the Lord in your church. Amen. Hey, maybe somebody, God is calling somebody here. Amen. Uh, to, to have their life altered. <laughs> you know, I remember, I, and I was doing this study here I was uh, stepped out of the church, and I, was, and, I, and I was praying as I was doing this study, and I said, Lord, I, I want to I know about a burning bush Baptist church. I want to know about one. Would you, would you just let me know about one? And about 30, 40 minutes after that, I had a reason to talk to a friend of mine about some radio things. And as I was talking to him, he said, Brother Oliver, he said, by the way, Brother Oliver, he said, we just celebrated, just last Sunday, we just celebrated our 2,000th Sunday. Our 2,000th Sunday of seeing somebody saved on our property at our church. 2,000 Sundays in a row. Oh, by the way, he probably runs about maybe 800 or more in Sunday school, runs a bunch of buses. Uh, you know if he runs a bunch of buses, he doesn't do it by himself. But I know this is unusual, but he, now he preaches all over the country. He probably, this man that I'm talking about, preaches probably every week on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday at some place around the country. But you know that every Saturday he visits his own bus route that he drives on Sunday morning. I said, Lord, I want to see a burning bush Baptist church. Will he let me see it? Amen. But you know what? That preacher doesn't do it by himself. He doesn't do it by himself. 
There are people in that church, they're serious. They're serious Christians. They pray, they read their Bible, they tithe. I preached in that church one time, and that preacher said to me, Brother Oliver, he said, I've got the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich. He said, I've got, I got two, I think it was two, he said, I've got two people that you preached at today. I've got two people that are millionaires. I said, hey, give me their numbers. <laughs> Everybody always asks that, don't they? Amen. A burning bush, Baptist, and nobody does it by themselves. It takes people. It takes people to get behind a preacher and pray and work, amen, and believe God and work and pray and believe God. What are you doing to contributing to your church being a burning bush? Oh, I'm not saying that you're not, but there are always things that we can do to, sh to be hotter, to shine brighter, amen, the burning bush. Baptist Church. How many of you tonight thank the Lord for your church? Do you thank the Lord for your church? I tell you, when I think about my church, my home church, my boyhood, I always get tender about it. I love that place. Now, boy, they've gone through the fires and they've gone through a lot and it grieves me, but I love that church and I love my church now. We got a church that's mission-minded. They got a, a, a people that are, um, you know, that... Uh, how, how would you say it, Kim? You know, like our handicapped ministry. They, they love our church and they feel welcome. I think when people like that, when they come into our church and they feel welcome, I think that makes Jesus very, very happy. Right. Amen. And we got a, a teenagers. Amen. Oh, listen, the Burning Bush Baptist Church, what can you do? What can you do to help to your church, to the success of your church being a burning bush, Baptist church. Yes. How many of you tonight are saved? Amen. Amen. You've been saved? How many say, I've been also been baptized, Brother Oliver? I'm saved and baptized. Isn't that good? Looks like everybody here has a testimony. If you're not saved tonight and you're faking it, please, let's get born again tonight. Amen. This whole church will just rejoice in your salvation. Amen. But listen, you... Remember, conviction. That conviction is that uneasiness that we sense, that we're drawn to it. We, we, just, we just feel that sense of guilt. Well, don't run from it. Run to it. When we answer back to that, then God has our attention and we're humbling ourselves. We're yielding to God. Then God can do something with us. But if we just repel it, we just shirk it off, We'll never, ever experience any kind of a transformation. The conviction of the Holy Ghost that leads us to that repentance. Amen. And then we can get victory. And we can do our part in our church to make it a burning bush Baptist church. But let's all stand together, shall we? Everybody standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. <laughs> now while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed... Now, I want you to think about the message. Think about it tonight. Think about how it applies to you. In some way, this message applies to you. In some way, in some way, really, God wants to use this message in your life. And I believe that He's already spoken. I believe He's already He's moving. He's leading. He's speaking to us. Now, we just have to respond to Him. Amen? we got to respond. And you got to recognize that. Now, I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on this invitation time. We're going to have a time of invitation. And uh, Miss Christian's going to play the invitation number for us. As soon as I say amen from this prayer, she's going to play for us. Now, I'm going to ask you to be spiritual enough to respond. And if all you can do is just come and sincerely and humbly say, Dear God, help me. I love my church. And I want our church to be a burning bush Baptist church. And this is what I, I know you want me to do. You want me to be to help to contribute to that. Father, we come to you tonight. We're so thankful and grateful for the sweet spirit of God that settles in upon us. Even now, Lord, I sense him here now. And would you just bless us, Father, with humility, Lord, and sincerity tonight. 
Help us to all look inside. If we never look inside, we're never going to be motivated to do anything. Bless this invitation time. Lord, do a great work in our hearts. Bless this solid rock Baptist church. Raise this church up. Lord, we know you're the church builder, brother. Brother uh, James, he can't build his church. Brother Devin, or not, we, we, we can't build a church. You're the one that's going to build it. We ask you to build it for your glory. Bless this invitation time for we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As the music plays, come on church. Find a place here at the altar. Let's pray about it tonight.